Food it, was good. And the delight is here. Yes. Now, there is a small price to pay for that. We may be losing a little bit of contrast <laughs> yeah. on the, certainly the projected images because when the sunlight pops out. But it's a small price to pay, and then we don't mind that Sorry. at all. So, uh, one small housekeeping from me, and that's just a suggestion to encourage you to have a look at the, the, the posters from the PhD forum, which are arranged just outside the door, really, through there and on this floor. So please take the time to have a wander around those uh, when you're looking, um, when you're chatting and having a coffee in the breaks and so forth. So I shall sit down now and leave you to Michelle, who's got some more information, and, and then on to our next speaker. Thank you, John. Uh, I will see you soon. And the uh, second thing is, uh, very soon you will have some breakout session. So I'm coming back with this little box that you have on your seats with a headset. And uh, you can follow all the breakout session out of these headset. The one, two, three, four. You have four breakout sessions. You can choose whichever you want. And you can switch from one to another one. And wherever you are, you, you will have the possibility to listen to it. There is an extra room as well, I think, up there, up there, downstairs. You still follow me? No. Yeah, that's what I thought. So again, you can choose the breakout session this afternoon, right? Good. You have four breakout sessions. One, two, three, four. Right? So far? And with the, you put your, the headset on your ear, on the ear, right? The headset, right? <laughs> you plug it in, and then you have a small button. And that's when the magic starts. You click on one, channel one, two, three, four. And depending on the channel, you will hear one of the breakout session. Which one is number one? Which one is number two? Uh, this is, number one is here. Number two is over there. So you can stay in the area and you will hear the breakout session. You have some extra room downstairs, over there. I don't know exactly where, but you will find it. And some people will guide you. OK? You had some good food? You, you got everything? Oh, good. Thank you. So we are born of light, said Louis Kahn. The seasons are felt through light. We only the world as it is evoked by light. That was Louis Kahn. So I have a few quotations from uh, Louis again for tomorrow. That's promised. But before, I would like to introduce you someone that will really wake you up now. And that is Omar Gandhi. He is uh, using natural light as a tool for creating a strong architectural narrative. And Omar Gandhi is a Canadian architect with practices in Toronto and Halifax. He opened his Halifax-based design studio, Omar Gandhi Architect, in 2010, and his second office in downtown Toronto in early 2016. Omar's work has not gone unnoticed, recognized as one of the world's top 20 young architects by Wallpaper magazine, one of Canada's 20 most influential people by Monocle magazine, and as one of 2016's emerging voice by the Architectural League of New York, the sessional instructor of his alma mater, uh, Dalhousie University, he is most definitely leaving his mark on the architectural community. So we are greatly privileged now to have uh, Omar Gandhi, who is coming now to talk about using natural light as a tool for creating strong architectural narrative. Thank you. Omar, the floor is yours. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Well, thank you all for being here. And I, I feel bad for Pear because he had you guys before lunch. Everyone was probably feeling a little tired and grumpy, and I get you at right after your dessert. So thank you very much. And I was also feeling a little bit nervous uh, before coming up here, and this kind woman over there yelled out at me, I really like your boots. And it, <laughs> and I, it really hit me right in the heart, uh, and, I, and I feel great now. So. So I'm actually from uh, the outside of uh, Toronto, Ontario, which is in the middle of the country. It's a huge country, as you know. 
um, and went to the University of Toronto uh, for a few years for my undergraduate degree. And maybe it was just a time in my life and felt like leaving home and leaving the city for a few sort of unknown reasons ended up making what would be kind of the most uh, important decision in my life. And that would be to basically get on a plane and go to a place I had never been before, but had only sort of heard of, and that's on the east coast of Canada uh, in Halifax, Nova Scotia. And so what ended up happening over there was I ended up enrolling in a school that was very different from anywhere else. There was a real sort of focus on making things with your hands. You know, the digital technology was there, but there was a real sort of emphasis on drawing by hand and modeling by hand and being able to walk around models and making things outside just near the school. So this was a student project, but an example of how we were really forced and encouraged uh, to understand and almost feel the context that surrounded us. So at the end of 2010, um, seven years ago, um, ended up finding a situation where, like many people, I happened to be out of a job. Um, I had a wonderful job working for uh, someone who's very, very well respected in Canada and across the world, Brian McKay Lyons, uh, who's a highly respected architect, uh, and ended up just sort of, you know, that didn't last for as long as I'd like to, uh, and sort of found myself here in my attic, not really knowing what to do with my life. And this sort of ended up becoming kind of the first stages of what would be my current uh, situation. And so like a miracle, there ended up being this little project for some friends of ours. Uh, they just wanted this little addition on the back of their pro uh, the back of their home. It wasn't a glamorous project at all, but I was sort of determined at that point uh, that no matter what the project was, whether it was a bathroom reno renovation or an addition like this, I was going to do something special. It was going to be something that uh, I'd be proud of. So this project's, project's called Cedar in Three Textures, and it's located in Liverpool, Nova Scotia, which is on the south shore of this incredible province. And I have to say, you know, not being uh, from this province itself, uh, you know, one of the things you realize very quickly is that it is definitely one of the most beautiful places on the planet. And so it's, it's a very lucky situation for me that I end up having the opportunity to spend my career building these projects in this incredible landscape. And so this community, um, it, was, it was a bit of a challenge because this was sort of on the fringe of the big cities. cities. Uh, this was in a little town, uh, you know, not unlike a lot of places in North America and around the world where economy is, uh, you know, faltering and there's an aging population and people moving out of the town. But it's also a place where kids still play outside and people notice everything and everybody knows everyone by their name and come over for dinner. And so this was a, actually a project for uh, a couple who happened to be the town doctors of this small town. So you can imagine, you know, they have a, a pretty important place in this community and everybody notices everything. And so when they decided that they wanted to do this addition on the back of their house, there were a few things that were really important to me and important to them. Uh, things like modesty, things like simplicity, uh, things like tap, untapping a view that actually wasn't uh, utilized before. Um, but then also controlling solar gain, because this was going to be on the south side of the house. Um, and, you know, as you can see in these traditional homes, windows were quite small, but if we were going to implement something modern with a lot of glass, we need to be quite strategic about this. And so sitting there at my desk, not really knowing, okay, this is now my first opportunity to kind of, you know, voice my own design strategy. You know, I know how these other people I had worked for had done it, but how was I going to do it myself? And it was really about taking in the real information about context, about people, and about places, and doing things as honestly as possible. And so it's about this back view, right? So it's, you know, these traditional methods like drawing a party that you don't often see in schools anymore. And these diagrams. So on, on the far left, you have the current massing where they had done this sort of, you know, hack job kind of uh, addition on the back of the house in the 1960s to this 150-year-old beautiful home. 
uh, and exploring, okay, well, this is what the maximum amount we could do was. Let, this is, you know, if we did that. But we're also facing south, and we need to control solar gain. And so we talked about recesses and overhangs. And literally, and I, and I talk about this when I'm teaching as well, is that this part T and this diagram isn't just the beginning of the design process. It's something you carry all the way through. And so we make models. Like I said, we make models out of wood in our studio. Uh, and, you know, of course, there are digital methods of calculating solar exposure uh, and shading, but there's another thing when you can actually use a laboratory and shine light on a model and see how these things work. And so this is the traditional part of the house, uh, and you actually see the modern addition on the back. Um, it was really important to sort of put almost horse blinders on the side of this house, almost to sort of conceal that anything had happened. And then on the back, a slightly more modern with these huge punched windows and this large overhang that basically moderate the amount of sun that would penetrate into the house while also allowing them the opportunity to see this beautiful river view from the back. And so this was really the first project, but it is something that I always like to talk about, these first three projects, um, because it really sort of led into everything else. And so this next project, um, not too far away from this, and something I forgot to mention about the first one, was that we actually interviewed four builders for that job. And in this small town, you can imagine there aren't a lot of people to go to, uh, but people who have probably done this their entire life and are really good at what they do. And on the fourth interview, we actually had someone come in, and this person literally blew us away, was so unbelievably knowledgeable, um, and ended up being someone that would teach me a lot about wood frame construction and architecture in general in the coming years. And so her name uh, was Debra, Her Debra Herman Spartanelli. And she actually got me this second job by meeting with some clients um, that basically came to her and said, you know, we have this old sort of cottage. Uh, we have this beautiful piece of land. We're not sure what we want to do with it. Do you know anyone who can design? And she said, well, yeah, I just happened to be working with this young guy. We just did this project down the road. Um, maybe you want to talk to, them, talk to him about it. So I met them. And I talked to them about the site. I talked to them about the location of the sun and about the view and that this thing that they had probably wasn't going to cut it. And so in one of those moments that could probably have been the absolute end of my career, uh, right at the beginning, I proposed to them, you know, what if we actually just knocked it down? You know, what if we cleaned the slate and actually started over? And, you know, you take a deep breath and you really just sit and wait for that reaction, almost like starting to walk towards the door, uh, thinking this probably was a bad decision. Um, and they loved it. You know, they loved that. They almost just needed somebody to just give them that little push, you know, almost like they were maybe embarrassed in this area to do something kind of lavish. Uh, to just sort of throw away a, you know, a perfectly good building. And so then I talked to them about this natural grove that was in this landscape, and they talked about their grandkids always sort of playing in this area. You know, like no matter where everyone was, they would always gravitate towards this little bowl that was in the grassy landscape. And I said, well, what if this building actually was like mother's arms? or grandmother's arms, and wrapped around this thing, and sort of uh, nestled sort of the family within these confines. And from everywhere in the cottage, you actually look towards the center, and you have this little amphitheater where the kids grow. And they loved it. And the process, and again, this is, you know, I, I always tell the students in school that this process that they go through while they're uh, learning is actually the same process that we use in the profession. It doesn't stop. You know, you start with these card models that I made in my attic, and it slowly transforms. And we do light studies, and we think about, you know, privacy. We think about the modest side of the house. But more than anything, we think about a narrative. And that's something I'm going to be talking about a lot in this talk. The idea of storytelling and, and finding meaning in a place by drawing from the people and the places that these things exist. And so we make structural models uh, and we do these light studies. And then 
the idea of this procession, this narrative. So imagine, you know, driving for an hour from the big city and actually going to this cottage on a regular basis. There was this vision I had that there would be this long period of time where you actually wouldn't see the sea at all. You would, even though you were driving parallel to it and driving towards the cottage itself, uh, you would literally see little sort of glimpses between the trees as you drove by in your car for, you know, an hour-long drive. And then when you actually get to the cottage itself, it was designed almost to be a plug so that it didn't give it all away. It was basically enclosing that view to hold it back as long as possible. And just like Frank Lloyd Wright would have done, we compressed sort of the entry and dropped it down and baffled the acoustics and play with lighting in a way that it would almost feel like a little vacuum right before this big reveal when you turned around the corner. And as long as they would do this journey, that would never lose its excitement. And so the idea of construction, this is always my favorite part where you, you know, it started with a card model that's really scrappy and you, know, you feel insecure about these ideas at the time. And you actually see men and women building it with little sticks and it starts transforming. And there aren't any electrical fixtures in there at that point. You're really seeing these really kind of elemental ideas of light and texture and materiality come together slowly. And this is also a really important part of this process as well. Again, when before those artificial lights go in, you really have the chance to investigate these ideas of high and low, um, darkness and light, and these contrasts that make kind of entering these different aspects of the architecture exciting. And ideas of texture and local materials. And seeing it all come together. So this is much more than uh, daylighting. This is more about architecture as it relates to context, the environment itself. And what makes it more complicated in this part of the world is that we have extreme climate. So you know there are times when you want to feel like both inside and outside, uh, like there's a seamless sort of line between the two. But then there are also times when architecture plays the role of a barrier between the elements. And continuing on, you know, this idea of connection between these first three sort of projects uh, before I really kind of started a larger company, uh, this project, the Moore Studio, which was also not far from there, uh, basically uh, a, a retired couple who had once been art students, much, you know, long before they had children, uh, were nearing retirement and their kids had gone and left and they actually lived in a basement apartment in the city. So a very modest place. But it was always their dream that at some point they would buy this forested piece of land and build some sort of very simple vernacular type building uh, that would be a place where they'd continue their dreams uh, of creating art. And so they came to me and they actually found out about the work that we had done from uh, reading an article about the previous two projects and my collaboration with this wonderful builder, Deborah. And so again, ideas of view and light and this idea of procession, feeling like not only are you putting a building on a landscape itself, but you're actually traversing the landscape and, f you know, uh, the architecture feels as though it grew out of the ground itself. And so we took this vernacular form and, you know, just using card models, did this actual very honest play. This, you know, this isn't a reproduction for, you know, publications and things. Is we make these models and are very true to the process of, you know, creating slits and maybe bending the wall back this way and slicing the roof open a bit so that you have this sort of gentle filtered light uh, on the upper level where the art studio is.
And again, this, this time in construction where you start seeing these kind of very abstract, kind of poetic ideas come together um, really is the most exciting part of the process. You know, talking about this sort of filtered light kind of dropping like a curtain um, over the, the art studio itself. Um, it's sort of in its purest form before the finishes really come in, when you're really just looking at framing and sheathing. And the beauty of these really raw local materials coming together and having this team of builders, all in their 20s at the time, uh, you know, working their butts off to make something beautiful out of something so unbelievably mundane and regular. And so as much as daylight is an important factor, the opposite is as important to this storytelling and feeling like you're in, uh, you know, kind of zones of recluse where you feel alone and you feel contained, it makes that sort of contrast that much more powerful. And this project, like I said, it was for uh, a couple that lived in a basement apartment. This was a very, very streamlined budget project where we actually went out, you know, you see that, see that steel grate there for a, um, a guard we found in the back of a dumpster at the steel uh, depot uh, and just said, you know, this is perfect. You know, th th this is as raw as it can get and it does exactly what we need to do. And so the final product is literally the embodiment of those original parties and diagrams. Um, and that's something that I'm really proud of. And this is a part of the story that I always like to tell. So I was saying that this was a team of 20-year-old builders. This was their first kind of major project, and this was really only my second or third. That day at the end when, you know, we finally gave the key over to the owners and we had left, it, it was a really special sort of moment to look around because everybody brought their camera because they were so proud of this project that they had put together in sweat on that they wanted to show their parents and their boyfriends and their girlfriends. You know, it's not something that you often see on a construction project, this kind of pride that goes into work. And so from those first three projects, you know, and being as true as possible to the information given and adapting these traditional forms uh, that are so beautiful and that people love in this area, um, I was able to sort of formulate this idea of idea of adaptation, and that's something that we try and stick with now. Uh, so our projects begin with a simple local precedent, often a hip roof or gable form. The form is then extruded up or across, bent or flattened, the roof planes folded and pleated. Sculpted by conditions in use, the reconstituted adaptation is receptive and responsive in its keeping with a modest formal lineage. And we applied that to the next series of projects. So those first three sort of all happened between 2010 and 2012. Uh, and it was time at that point to start hiring a couple people, move out of my attic. And so I moved into my first little studio space where I had one person. And then a couple years later, uh, in 2014, I moved into a larger space and a few more people in Halifax. And just this year, uh, opened uh, a new studio in my native Toronto area. Uh, where we're working on more urban projects uh, as well as kind of rural projects in that area as well. So I basically split my time between the two. And so over this period of time, those three became, you know, 10, 11, 12 projects, but really sticking with this idea of uh, a narrative in architecture. And so I have a few projects that I'm going to talk about um, that followed that period of time, and I might run out of time, and that's okay. We'll just stop wherever. Yeah. 
<laughs> so Sluice Point, it's actually the southern tip of Nova Scotia, actually for a client who came to us from Switzerland. So one of the wonderful things about Nova Scotia, maybe not everyone thinks it's wonderful, but um, like I said, it's one of the most beautiful places on earth, but land is actually quite affordable. And so you have a lot of Americans, you have a lot of people from other parts of Canada, but you also have a large amount of German and Swiss uh, clients who buy land uh, in this area. Uh, and develop these kind of wonderful little projects over time. And so this was a Swiss client that came to us uh, in an area that I don't think many people would have thought would be an ideal place for a cottage, but he actually thought it was beautiful. And so we took kind of the initial ideas and precedents from kind of the regional history of the area, these salt bales uh, where they'd actually dry uh, hay uh, on these mounds, and you see it in these old Acadian kind of villages uh, in the adjacent area of where the project was. But it also, you know, just physically looks and feels as though when you squint your eyes, like these mounds grow out of the ground. And so that was sort of the starting point for this project um, that we developed. And so the idea was that it would be this contorted form with this sort of pleated roof. Uh, that would look out towards this marshy sort of lakeside coastal uh, view, but the roof itself would uh, zig and zag and actually extend out f in the furthest area where uh, you'd have the most solar exposure. So again, this idea of maximizing view but really controlling uh, the amount of light that would be entering the building itself. So again, these card models, so we, you know, it, this did never change. We still kind of go through this process of starting with these regional forms and bending it where the views are and bending it where the light is and where kind of the key elements of the site are. And we have areas where the roof itself defragments, where the sheathing and the cladding itself actually runs away, and you actually have these brise soleil uh, effect uh, that allows filtered light in from the roof itself. And so again, the project coming together and seeing these small sticks you saw in that last image uh, where it's built of all prefabricated trusses to create this extre extremely complex form um, where none of these trusses themselves are actually similar in any way. And so the final product with this kind of filtered light that beams through the space itself. And this roof that overhangs where it needs to, almost projecting, take, you know, extending out and adapting from kind of that regular form. The next project, Rabbit Snare Gorge, was actually for a, I'm still good for time? Yeah, uh, was for a lawyer from New Jersey um, who actually had this beautiful piece of land in an area on the north side of uh, Nova Scotia, which has become very popular. Uh, a lot of American artists had lived there for uh, several decades, but has increasingly become uh, a popular place for people uh, to own, and you'll see why. So you have this incredibly rocky, dramatic landscape, high winds, extreme weather, but really kind of, you know, you don't find anything more beautiful than this landscape. And so he owned this big swath of land, and the idea was to create this cabin. The cabin would be one of uh, several buildings that would be on the site. Um, and so it actually wasn't far off from the road, so it was really almost like a lookout like a watchtower that would look out towards the valley itself, uh, the coast in the beyond, as well as the forest. And so the name Rabbit Snare Gorge actually comes from one of the elders uh, in the community who had lived there 
um, or his family had lived there for centuries. Um, and he, I remember talking to him about the history of this landscape and why it wasn't used for farming and why it hadn't been developed. And basically, because of the terrain itself, uh, he said that really all it was good for was granddad taking us out and teaching us how to snare rabbits. And so this would be like a little hunting kind of fun place for grandfather and kids. And so we named the, the project uh, as well as the property Rabbit Snare Gorge. And so again, extruding kind of the massing itself and pleating it and creating this gable form, opening and slicing up parts of the wall and the roof to allow for really unique views of different aspects of the site. I, I really, I don't think there's anything less interesting than going, you know, walking into a building and seeing everything kind of all at once. Th this is the idea of actually kind of winding your way up a building and feeling like you're getting these really unique kind of views or experiences of, of uh, a unique landscape itself. And so we look for local precedents. I mean, this is what gives the work meaning. This is an image uh, in Newfoundland uh, on the east coast of Canada, and it's something they actually find and see uh, in a lot of places, usually made out of plywood, really rough materials. Uh, it's something that just stuck out because being where I'm from uh, in, you know, towards Toronto area, you don't have uh, things that look like kind of tacked on like this. You know, it doesn't really look very thought out. And so really what it is is it's a windbreak. So you can open the door. The door doesn't slam shut because of the high winds. It's also a sheltered place where you can have a cigarette and not get wet. Um, and so I thought, you know, this is, again, like that, that first project I told you, these chances you take as an architect that, you know, might end up in failure, but you, can't, you almost can't help yourself. I said, well, what if, what if we actually did something like this as well? And he was like, okay, yeah, that... That'd be interesting. But what if we did it out of core 10 steel and it was 25 feet high and it weighed about three tons? And he said, let's do it. And so there we go. We have this incredible entryway that really kind of was drawn from uh, this local precedent that is so regular that I don't think anybody even notices it in the area. And you have this doppled light on the backside that basically uh, filters through and moves as the sun is moving uh, with these skylights and these vertical lines on the back of the house. Uh, you actually have these kind of uh, focused beams of light shifting and revolving around the house throughout the day. So again, it's about daylight, it's about views, but it's about using it just like we use all of the tools that we use in architecture. Uh, we use it delicately and where it matters. And we use it so that we can tell a story. And so this was uh, a project that's actually adjacent to the cabin. And I actually put this in here because uh, I feel like my son, who's five years old, kind of inspired this project because he's really into, I don't know if over here you have the cartoon Transformers, but um, we basically made a building that was kind of like a Transformer. So I have two projects left. You cut me off if... Uh, 10 minutes, okay, sure. So uh, near this last project, um, there was a very, very narrow piece of land. And they referred to this property, uh, you know, over the decades as the lookout because really it was good for nothing other than it was a place where you would stop off uh, and you would just sit and look at the coastline itself. And so there was really this partie that began this idea of kind of a linear massing uh, that basically 
what had a single loaded corridor looking out towards the view. But what makes this site, as well as you know, a lot of the sites that we deal with in Nova Scotia, um, are the extremities. So we have driving wind. We have rain that's sideways. It doesn't rain vertical. Or you know, vertical. Uh, these are all things that you want to think about. So really, the idea with this project was it was like a dagger cutting into the wind. And you have this extreme sort of cliff that even where the house is itself and the fact that you're, you know, quite a bit away from the edge, it feels like you're being pulled in almost. And so the form of this house was actually uh, designed to feel both anchored physically, but also as if it had like an aerodynamic quality to it itself. <coughs> and so from these different rooms in the house, you actually have these different, very, very different qualities of light. You have these sort of pixel sort of windows. You have these long linear strips. You have kind of floor to ceiling glass itself. Uh, on the back side, you have you know, a very narrow strip of windows. So really, depending on where you are in this house, uh, you have kind of these different qualities uh, that really accentuate different aspects of the site. So really like a dagger cutting into the wind and cutting into the snow. And where we have the double height window, we have a brise soleil that basically controls and filters that light when you have uh, the extreme summer sun. Feels like you're pretty close to the edge, doesn't it? <laughs> yes. <laughs> and final project. Sure. So this project is called Float. Um, this was not far outside of Halifax, which is the major, major city in Nova Scotia, and in a valley that's basically a glacial valley that is good for basically nothing other than uh, mountain biking and hiking, because what was left kind of after this transformation of the landscape were these humongous outcroppings of rock. And we saw that as an opportunity. So again, by going through this process of looking at regional form and breaking up the massing and uh, really kind of um, focusing in on key characteristics of the site, including the rock itself, we wanted this project to feel as though this project was the landscape. These forms were part of these rocks itself. So even traversing the plan, you know, it isn't a flat terrain. You actually walk up and down and wind your way through this project, almost as if this was the landscape untouched. Again, focused views, really kind of thinking about where it's critical to allow light in, where it's critical to look out, so that in each aspect of this place, it feels as though you're seeing something uh, for the first time. And the idea of this roof to allow in light, so instead of a skylight in this situation, we actually just opened up the roof almost like, you know, the headlight of one of those old sports cars that just sort of like lift up like a top and just allow a little bit of shaded light in there. So as much as daylight is important uh, within the building, architectural light coming out as being almost a monument or kind of an object in the landscape is something we think very much about.
and walking through these rocks and feeling as if you're not just sort of walking through a building, you're actually walking through the crevice between these boulders themselves. And my team, thank you guys very much. Thank you, Omar, for that presentation. Um, and quite stunning it was. I think the sun and the weather really